We're going to start in Acts chapter 22 today, verse 30. We'll just back it up one verse because it helps provide some good context. But Acts chapter um, 22, verse 30 says, But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. They must have noticed I was like standing further, really far back. Um, God is going to wash you or strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. And then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the morning. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, as always, um, this time together would be pointless if it weren't for your spirit speaking through me. Um, uh, may, may you overcome my weaknesses um, as a teacher. And may you teach the hearts of those that hear today, that we might walk away from this time together knowing more about how you would have us think about our faith, and particularly in our boldness of it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so as I just prayed, um, I think this passage is about helping us um, see that we can have boldness in the face of adversity. That's how I titled this, Boldness in the Face of Adversity. Um, I see three um, ultimate um, sections of it. You have verse 30 to verse 5, um, where we see there is courage in adversity. There's courage in adversity. And then I see in verses 6 through 10, wisdom and discernment through adversity. And then finally, um, verse 11, encouragement in adversity. So that's kind of my outline for you today. Uh, the, I wanted to start again in verse 30 because I think it helps set the stage a little as to what's happening. Um, why is Paul, especially if you weren't able to be here the last week when Bob was going through the passage, but this sets the stage when you think of verse 30, it goes all the way back. It's rooted in chapter 22, verse 24, um, where um, there was a riot where it says the tribune ordered him to be brought back to the barracks, um, sorry, verse 23 is what I meant to write down, and as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, and that was because after Paul had said what he said starting in verse 17, he got them all riled up. And so if you go back to 22, 17, he says, when I had returned to Jerusalem, this is him giving his testimony, he's saying, when I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And so that was Paul giving his testimony about what had happened to him on the Damascus Road. 
And so when he says, go, for I, or when, when he repeats that God had told him that he would be sent to the Gentiles, that's when this crowd gets into an uproar. Why is that? Get us started in our discussion. Why did the crowd get so upset about that? He's speaking to a Jewish crowd in Jerusalem, and they get really, really bent out of shape when he says, I'm going to send you to the, to the Gentiles. Why? Louise. The Jews hated the Gentiles. Now, why did they hate the Gentiles? That's very right, but why? They weren't like them. They didn't believe the same things. They were a separate group. They spoke of Gentiles as dogs, right? They were a superior race, that they were God's chosen people. And so the, the, the truth of God, Luis? And they were to separate themselves. Yes. And they were, they were commanded to separate themselves from the Gentiles. But ultimately, I think we can see through the biblical narrative that the Jews missed the point a little. And so, yes, all those things were true, but the goal was for Israel to be a light that would draw the nations to Israel, draw the nations to God, so that they would then convert to Judaism and follow the one true God and become the people of God. But the Jews got to a point where they were exclusive in their religion, and they were like, no, unless you're born of a Jew, then this is not for you. And so, um, that was really what became the sticking point now between Paul and this Jewish crowd. When he said that God had told him that he would be sent to the Gentiles, that was, that was just a terrible thing. Like, how can you possibly say that? So that's what causes the riot. Well, the tribune that's observing this whole you know, commotion pulls him out so that he doesn't get killed in the riot, but he also, he's not familiar with the intricacies of the Jewish faith. The Romans um, stayed out of that as much as they possibly could. As Bob was teaching us last week, what they were most concerned about was that they just kept the peace. And so um, what does he do? He's like, well, I, I don't know what this guy has done. He's clearly done something wrong according to the Jewish law. And so he takes them in front of the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin, um, the, uh, this is a definition of them that I pulled up online. They were the most authoritative body amongst the Jews. They consisted of 71 members, including the high priest, elders, scribes, and leading Pharisees and Sadducees. The high priest usually served as the president. They handled religious, legal, and political matters, including issues of Jewish law, religious observances, and disputes. And it also had authority over matters involving the temple in Jerusalem. And that's a really good definition of the Sanhedrin to give you an idea of why does the tribune then take Paul to the Sanhedrin and say, you guys put him on trial, tell me what the charge is, and then the, the Roman tribune would have been then responsible for executing whatever judgment it was that was necessary to punish Paul. And so what Paul is doing is he's going before the Sanhedrin as a trial, and that's what's supposed to happen there. So that's the stage. That's where we start. And another thing that I think you can see as well that Paul, in verse 1 of chapter 23, he's he starts off by simply saying, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Now, Paul makes this claim often. He actually makes it um, in chapter 24, verse 16, before Felix. He says, So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Um, in, chapter, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, he says, As to the righteousness before the law, blameless. As to the righteousness before the law, blameless. Now, that's interesting language. So, um, I'll, I'll give you a hint, because I want you to start thinking about this. It was a provocative statement to make, and that's why he gets the reaction from Ananias that he gets. So, I want you to think about why that was provocative, why that was provocative. But before we get into that in light of the Jewish faith, Paul says frequently throughout the, path, the New Testament that he was blameless before the law. Are, how does that measure up against your understanding of the gospel? Does that, does that make anybody's brain get a little, a little skewed? Jacob? I guess the way I always understood it is kind of how um, it's revealed in, in uh, God's teaching to me that there's an ambulance of God's word here and that God judges the heart. And so I kind of understood that as uh, what says blameless to be according to man's uh, standard, not God's standard. 
Okay, he's, he's blameless according to man, man. Jacob is saying he's blameless according to man's standard, but not to God's standard. And in fact, let's flip over just so that that can be reinforced. Jacob speaks well in this context. So Philippians chapter 3, you just flip over there real quick. Read this for yourself. Because he's where he says that in verse 6, he's speaking of the fact, again, according to man's standard, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But then what does he say in verse 7? But whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So what is Paul saying here? The gospel, sorry, following the Jewish law in which he was blameless, and he's standing before the Sanhedrin on trial, and he's asserting, I'm innocent, right? It's just like in American courts, right? When you, when the, what does the judge first ask? Do you plead guilty or not guilty? That's essentially Paul's way of saying, I'm not guilty of any charge that has been that has been um, assessed toward me. I'm an innocent man before the law. But that is not the same. And I wanted to draw that out because I actually have had people ask me that. In fact, I actually had a neighbor ask me this, this uh, two weeks ago. Like, what does Paul mean when he says he's blameless? Is he saying that he's never sinned? Well, no, he's not saying that at all. In fact, this passage, I believe, when Paul responds to the high priest is a sin. On, uh, on Paul's part. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Uh, but what is, he, what is he saying? He's saying that before the law, the Jewish law, he was blameless. He followed it. He followed those observances. He was faithful to the law. But that is not what saves. That is not what saves. That's what Paul then goes on in Philippians 3 to say. So sometimes people will think that there's the, I don't remember where it's at now. Where does the, uh, in one of the Gospels, people will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? Um, and then yet he's going to say to them, depart me from me, for I never knew you. That was how my neighbor asked me the question in, in light of this, because he was afraid. He goes, is that me? Right? Am, I, am I going to be cast into hell? Because is that what the Lord's going to say to me? I want you to see the difference here of what Paul said in Philippians 3. Because he's really drawing out that you could be perfect according to man's standard, but not perfect according to God's standard. And what does it take to be perfect according to God's standard? Whose righteousness must you have? Say it. Okay, you don't need to say that one softly. You guys, that's the, that's the Sunday school answer that you can, you'll always be right. Jesus, right? I need Jesus' righteousness. And that's what Paul says in Philippians 3. He's like perfect before the law of the Jews but imperfect in the law of God, and he needed Christ. He needed Christ's righteousness. So in this passage here, when you see Paul say again that he stands blameless, he's giving, he's giving a, a testimony. He's stating, I'm not guilty. I'm innocent before the law, but he still needs Christ. He still needs Christ. So then we see him have, I think, some great courage um, through the course of this conversation. Um, first off, it was his boldness towards the Jews that we, just, um, that we just read back in chapter 22 that got him in this position. Um, he's giving his testimony about what God has done and how God has used him amongst the Gentiles. He would have known right off the bat that that statement was going to fire them up because he knew their culture. He was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He once stood holding the cloaks of everyone while they stoned Stephen for the same thing. Paul knew that what he was going to say was going to cause the ruckus, but he had boldness 
and he had a clear conscience, and so he makes these claims with confidence. And that is why it caused Ananias to strike him on the cheek, because in what way was that a provocation? Now, let's talk about that. How was this a provocation for him to assert his blamelessness before the before the Sanhedrin. Why was that a provocation that would cause Ananias to do what he did? Thoughts? A little bit harder question. I see the wheels are turning. He's questioning their judgment, okay? Yeah, so uh, John's saying they, they already see him as a troublemaker. He's, got, he's rising up mobs and violence. And so in some sense, it could be just the political thing. And that's something to understand about the Sanhedrin. Um, it was largely run by the Sadducees. The high priest was a Sadducee. And that's an important historical context. I don't think this is going to be the only reason, but I think it plays into what John's saying. I think it plays into this because the Sadducees were like the aristocrats in the Jewish environment, right? They were the landowners. And so when Rome comes in and takes over Palestine in those days, who's, who's going to have a vested interest in keeping their land and their money? The rich people, right? <laughs> so those were largely the Sadducees, this aristocratic class of priests. And so they were very much in cahoots with Rome because they had an economic interest to be able to stay with Rome. And in that respect, what, what was something that Bob taught us last week? The Romans wanted one thing above all, peace, so that they got what? The taxes. It was all about money, right? Follow the money, right? <laughs> so they wanted peace so that the economy stayed going, so that they got their taxes, and then they would basically pay their taxes to Rome, and all would be well. And so the Sadducees, of course, now are part of this economic arrangement. They're part of this economic system. And so they see Paul. Paul has a reputation for causing riots all over the place, across all of, all of um, the Roman kingdom at that point. And so they don't see him as in innocent, and, but he's claiming his innocence. And you want to think of something else. There's a little bit more to it, a little bit more nuance here as to what Paul says when he asserts his innocence. Kelly? Not true, but I feel like they never thought him as innocent. Uh, Yeah, arrogance. And so it was an arrogant statement. According to Ananias, it would have been arrogance that Paul was displaying to, to assert that level of innocence. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's exactly what it was, is that he was saying, Allison? Yes, and I think that in many respects, what would Paul be thinking is that he would be thinking of his innocence because of his righteousness of Christ, but the Sanhedrin, which did not share that belief in Christ, would have felt that guilt, kind of ties into where Kelly's playing with, or where Kelly was going with that, that no one could be innocent, so it's blasphemous to say that you're innocent. It would almost been in this, maybe in a similar way, it would have been like me standing up here asserting that I'm without sin. How would you guys respond to that? Hopefully you pull your Bible out. You go to 1 John. If anyone says he's without sin, then the truth is not in him, right? So, right? Hopefully you do that. But in a sense, that's what's going on here. Now, Ananias is also a cruel person. We learned from Josephus, the Jewish historian, that he was a very cruel man. He was actually killed many um, years later um, when, uh, the, when the Jewish... Um, when the Jewish, the Jewish people revolted against Rome in AD 70, he was actually killed right away. Um, and so, but he was not a very well-liked high priest. Um, he, the Josephus said that he was cruel, he was filled with greed, he allowed his servants to plunder the tithes that were meant to go to the priest. Um, and so he wasn't, a, he wasn't a kind man in and of itself, but his 
is ultimately his command to then strike Paul was an absurd one. Why is that? I think it helps you understand a little bit, like because I said earlier, I think Paul stepped over the line. We'll talk about that in his response to Ananias, but I, I think it also helps me understand a little bit about Paul's a warm-blooded man. <laughs> he did what he did for a good reason, at least. Um, but what? Why was it absurd for Ananias to do what he did? You get some insight into this by looking at the text. Let's look at verse four. Um, sorry, verse three. Um, when when Paul's response to him. But why was it absurd for Ananias to strike? or to have Paul struck in that moment. Okay. There's no legitimate reason under the law. Why was there, why could we say that? There was no legitimate reason. Why would Paul feel that? Mm. Right. Right. And so Gary is saying, absolutely. Um, if you go to Leviticus 19.15, the law required that there be a due process. Um, that a trial occur. This is like right at the beginning. Paul's merely asserted that he was innocent. No trial has happened. No opportunity for examination has occurred. And so Ananias does, according to the Jewish law, law step over the line in him, and immediately having Paul punished or struck for that. Um, Deuteronomy 25, 1 through 2, it's, it explicitly states that punishment could only be administered after being found guilty. And so that's the thing that Ananias um, break. So it was absurd for Ananias to do what he did, and Paul reacts the way that Paul reacts. What does he say? He says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall, and then he makes that same defense that Gary brought up. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to law, you order me to be struck? So Paul's response, in a sense, invokes a curse on Ananias. And so he, he says, um, it's very similar to what we hear Jesus say um, in Matthew 23, 27, when he calls the Pharisees whited sepulchers. Or, um, so what is he saying there? You're, you're, you're these graves, these rotten graves that have this whitewash on the outside that make you look like you're all okay. So that's what Paul is saying to Ananias. You're a whitewashed wall. There's nothing but emptiness behind you but you've got the wall painted white and it makes it look like all is well. So he would have been standing there most likely in his high priestly garments as a representative of God's people, as a representative of the law, and then yet violating the law. And so Paul has a sharp rebuke in response to Ananias. It doesn't, as I see it, it doesn't seem like it's in line with Jesus' words to turn the other cheek. It doesn't even seem like it's in line with Paul's own response or his own commands that in, when he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 12, that, um, to bless when reviled. And so that's in a sense kind of what we see playing out here. And so Paul's response, I see as is apologetic, right? He says, when they say, well, would you revile God's high priest? And how does Paul respond? I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, in full transparency, I really struggled with understanding what was going on here. And so I had to go to the commentaries on this one and get some perspective. And so I thought this was helpful. There's, I think, a lot that could be playing out here. Um, number one, and this is, this is going to be now for you to decide. You're going to have to work through this and struggle with, did Paul sin or not? Right? That's the big debate amongst the commentators. Um, you know where I'm falling on this already, but Clearly, when he says, I did not know that he was the high priest, he could have been simply unaware. Paul has not been in Jerusalem much, and so maybe he didn't know that Ananias was the high priest. Um, it could have been some, some think that it was a result of his poor eyesight, and so that's a, a common thinking about Paul is that he had poor eyesight, and, um, and so he just simply couldn't see, you know, in this big room, he couldn't, he couldn't necessarily see back there that it was the high priest that made this statement. Um, or it could have been that he was stating that Ananias wasn't acting like the high priest. And so it was, here is the high priest. He's supposed to, again, be a representative of God's people. He's supposed to represent the law amongst God's people, but yet he's violating the law. And so what was Paul saying? He's giving a little bit of an ironic response, but yet still apologetic, acknowledging that he did not give 
proper dignity and respect to the office in his response. That's what I think is happening. It seemed to me to be the most plausible. And in, in, in the end, you're going to have to use a little bit of your sanctified speculation um, in order to work through this passage, so I wouldn't hold a strong opinion one way or another. But um, I think that Paul recognizes in that moment and gives a genuine apology that he did not afford proper respect to the dignity of the high priest office, even though the man was not deserving of that respect. And I see that his initial response was one that was a reaction to the man and the offense that that man caused him, and he lost sight of that. But yet, because he is a law-abiding Jew, he made it very clear that he respected the role in the office, and so he apologizes. Thoughts on that? Anyone else study this and work through this on their own to think maybe have a little bit of a comment here or there on that? Let the... Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think, I, I agree with you. I think you could, you could land a lot of ways on this, and at the end of the day, it requires a little sanctified imagination to get through this, but... Yeah, and that's, yeah. Until they say that he is the high priest. Yeah. So. Sam? I also think it's, it shows the, you kind of pointed out the very human side of Paul. Um, and I don't know how many people have been slapped or punched in the face, but you don't have a lot of time to, nope. in that moment, you don't really think. I mean, we have these sanctified moments where if I were to say something to you, you could say, okay, well, that's your opinion. You can calm yourself down. When you physically are hit, struck, you, you tend to lash out pretty quick. So I think it shows the human side of Paul, whether he sinned or not, I don't think it really matters because like you said in First John, no one is without sin. So I think Paul, if he didn't sin in that way, he probably sinned in another yeah. at this time or another. But I think I think it also shows his, his uh, willingness to be quick to repent, and especially toward uh, maybe a counsel that he's received. And uh, I know there's times where I've been called in for boss or something and felt like I was wrongly accused of something, but I'm not going to go in there guns a blazing and be like the Paul here where I would, you know, all of us would humbly, you know, respect him and say, sure, you know, like Paul did. So I think it just shows the real human side of Paul, and oftentimes we look at the um, apostles and think that they're levitating above all of us, mm-hmm. uh, when really they're just normal men at the very best. Well said. I hold no judgment against Paul for his actions here. I would have done worse, I'm sure. <laughs> so um, I would not have had as much of a sanctified response as Paul did. But I think Sam was teasing out there what I see is one of the ultimate applications that I pulled out of this passage. And that is that, you know, we're going to interact with a world that is opposed to us. We're going to interact with a world that wants to destroy us and destroy that which we believe in. And it can, it can create moments like this where we're going to feel insult. We're going to feel rage. We're going to feel incensed because of what we see happening around us and we see what being oftentimes perhaps even being done to us or to people that we love. And what is important for us to keep clear is that as we're respectful, that we represent as an ambassador of Christ well. And that's important for us to keep in mind because I think I, I see a lot of Christians make this mistake, especially on social media. Um, I just, you know, honestly, at this point in my life, I just feel like you're just better off not to have an argument on social media. I'm not saying it's wrong, but um, choose choose your words wisely, I guess. But but yeah, you can feel wrong. You can feel like you've been treated unjustly, or you just simply get incensed that they are killing babies. Right? And, or whatever the issue at hand might be. But be bold. Speak the truth. But do so in love and do so respectfully. And, you know, if you, if you lose that, that respect and that love, you, you, you stop representing Christ the way we see him represent and how he argued against the Pharisees, particularly 
in the Bible. He didn't, he didn't hold punches, but he also wasn't disrespectful. And so he, he held them accountable, but he wasn't disrespectful. He didn't, he didn't go across, um, he didn't violate the law by any means. He couldn't have. Um, that would have caused lots of problems, but be careful with that. John. Truth without love is contempt. Very well said. Gary. Is there another component of this thing that goes to the ultimate, at the end of the day, is to put down the gift of God? And that's evidenced by the fact that the jury decides to take that. So, ultimately, in life, at the end of the day, the jury's looking at it. You guys have no legitimate authority. That's what I saw. Yeah, it could be what, what Gary's saying is it could be that Paul sees them as not having any legitimate authority. Um, maybe we could grab a coffee and tease this out a little bit more. I, I, I struggle with that. I'll just be honest and transparent. I've always struggled with that because I think that it was the authority of the land at best known at the time. And so it felt to me, that, and so I'm, you know, this is where you get into those, I think, arguments, or not arguments, but debates, where, you know, like, for example, if I was alive during the time of King George, would I have been a patriot? I probably would have, the way I've kind of worked through it, instead of a revolutionary. Um, but what's right before the law, and what's right, and so I think that's, I, that's what I, that's the, the essence of what I, what I hear there. Um, I, I struggle with that one personally. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I can't get there. <laughs> so I hope that helps. But yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna move us on because I want to because I want to make sure we have time to get to what is the next ch chunk of the passage here, and that is where and he gets into verse chapter six, verse ten. He starts to now um, really start to draw out. He, he senses amongst this group. It says there he perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees. And so we learn that he then makes the statement about it is with respect um, to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. And then, of course, this big dissension arises. And the reason it states there is because the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection or they didn't believe in angels or they didn't believe in spirits. And so this is where we get a lot of good jokes, right? Why didn't the Sadducees enjoy baking bread? Because um, they didn't believe in rising. Why were the Sadducees always so downtrodden? It's because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. So lots of dad jokes can come out of the Sadducees, of course. But, uh, but that's what we learned. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They had no eschatology. Um, they were one of three primary schools of thought amongst the Jews. There were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. Um, the Essenes, you don't really see a whole lot. They pretty much went off into the, um, into the caves and stayed there and stayed out of, stayed out of society as a whole. Um, that's why you see the Sadducees and the Pharisees oftentimes being referred to often um, in this battle. The Sadducees would have been considered more of the conservative branch of Jewish, um, of Jewish uh, thinking and, and Jewish thought. They took a very literal interpretation of the Old Testament and so they saw what the Pharisees would say about the resurrection and, and whatnot as being innovations in theology, and therefore they rejected that. And so that's the, that's the debate that you see going on now. Paul knows that. He was a Pharisee himself. He was trained as a Pharisee under Gamaliel, right? So he's going to have clear vision into this. And so he plants a well-planted <laughs> um, statement. It looks like it's manipulative, doesn't it? Am I the only one that thinks that on the surface? Sam, you're, you're raking, all right, Sam's saying yes. Welcome back, Sam. It's good to see you again. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it seems a little manipulative. Like he, he knows that he can just get these guys to, and maybe that plays into what you're saying, Gary, about he, he just sees this as a false court and he's just gonna like, you know what? Let these, let these hooligans just go fight with each other. And so maybe that's, maybe that's what he's doing. But is there another explanation for why he would say that? Remember, my title of my lesson is Boldness and Adversity. <laughs> He's speaking the truth. Thank you. What's the truth? Yeah, there is, okay, there is that division. It's truth, and he's pointing it out, but what, what, is, what is an aspect of that truth of the resurrection that nobody in that council believes? 
that Jesus Christ is risen. Yes, there is now what divides Paul from even the Pharisees in that council. So the resurrection divides Paul from the Sadducees and from the secularists that are part of it. But it is the resurrection of Christ that divides Paul from all. And so I see that as a bold statement for him to make. Because you see the outcome. Again, I don't think Paul was a fool. I don't think Paul was just manipulating the council at this point. I think that he was trying to, um, he did perceive that. And then, I mean, there was probably some component of that. I don't deny that. I think that's how Luke, um, in some respects, portrays it. But I also see Paul as taking a bold stand for the truth here. And that he's gonna, he's, he wants to say, he wants to drive the conversation to Christ. He wants to drive it to Christ. He wants to drive it to the Savior. He wants them to see the same truth that he has been trying to tell them for, for years, even though he knows they have no ears to hear and that they won't listen to him. He still is trying to make that statement. His hope is in the resurrection of the dead. And it's not just in this theological debate that his hope lies in. His hope is in his resurrection from the dead. His hope is that he knows they will be resurrected from the dead to judgment apart from their faith in Christ. And so that is ultimately the issue at hand. It is ultimately the issue that if the tribune was paying attention, he'd recognize that this is the religious, the key of the religious debate, the key of the religious disagreement that exists between Paul and all of these people. And so they get all upset. They want to tear him apart. Um, and that's where it kind of ends in that sense. But <clears throat> what I want us to see in this passage, what I was picking out of this, again, I always try to take this and say, what does this mean for my life? Like, how can this draw me to live as I see Paul living? And that is to make bold claims about Christ, to make bold claims about Christ. So what I said was that what separated, and I want you guys to answer this question, what separated Paul from the Sanhedrin? It was his belief in what? Not just the resurrection, but resurrection of Jesus. There you go. Some of you were saying Jesus. You're whispering it. Come on, be confident. You know it's Jesus, right? It was this belief in Jesus. He's making a bold claim about the resurrection of Christ here. So what do you want to do? Make bold claims about the resurrection of Christ. Make bold claims about the resurrection of Christ. How will people respond to you when you do that? What was that, Allison? Not always in a good way. In what ways will they respond that are not good? They won't talk to you again. They shun you. Absolutely. Ignore you. Oh, that's... Gary got a little bit... A little out there. Oh, some pretty extreme religious views. Mocking. Mocking. Yeah, they'll make fun of you. Yeah, gossip about you and, and, and sabotage you, undermine you. They want to hear more. They want to hear more. Very good, Jeff. Yeah, that, that is true. That is, that is, that happens. What a blessing it is, what that does. Sometimes they'll debate with you. They want to hear no more because they just are getting into an intellectual debate and they're not necessarily seeking, but many times they're seeking. Questioning. questioning, yeah. So they may be at that stage where they are, um, where it says, you know, where they're at that watering stage and the planting of the seed stage. God may give the increase in the years to come. So you see, there's risk when we make bold claims for Christ. But there is reward in that risk. So in a sense, what am I encouraging you to do? Take risks for the kingdom. Take risks for the kingdom. Because when I read a passage like this, when I always see these passages play out in Acts, I am always convicted because I am such a risk-averse person. Like, I will calculate things through and be like, well, if I do this, then this is going to happen, and then, oh, I don't want that. And so then what do I do? I change my behavior. And it keeps me from taking risks because I'm a people pleaser. I want people to like me. I want people to like me. But I think what Paul recognizes, and it ties into some sense of where Gary's going with this, is that he recognizes that this is an invalid counsel, that there is no purpose to this. This is not going to produce anything of value. But what will? Sharing the truth of the gospel will. Sharing the truth of the gospel 
So take that mindset into the relationships that you have. Take that mindset into the, that risk calculation that you're having. I mean, the, the Word of God cl- makes it clear for us to not throw our, our, our pearls before swine. But on the other hand, we should be bold for the kingdom. We should be bold as ambassadors of Christ. And we should recognize that that boldness is helpful, that boldness is necessary, because what am I looking at? I'm looking beyond the earthly to the eternal. And I know you've heard me say this a lot, but it comes up a lot in Acts, so I'm here again. But look beyond the earthly, go to the eternal, and use that as your motivation to be bold and to share the truth of the gospel. And so make those bold claims. Where am I at here? Hold on a sec. Be- okay, so that's, that's where I'm at. All right, I'm in the same place. And so um, let me give you an illustration of this. Um, I mentioned this at months ago, so I'm going to say it again because it was many months ago at the beginning of Acts. Uh, we as Christians do not worship the same God as the Muslims, the Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and so on. We do not worship the same God. Why is that? Does anyone remember when I said that a few months ago? It was three or four months ago. I know that's hard. I had to look it up, see what I said. Not just kidding. Why do we not worship the same God as those people? What is it about their theology that separates Jews, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons? What separates us from them? What was that? The works. The works. Okay, yes, works in some sense, yes. Who separates us from that? The triune God, yes. The triune God. Don't let anyone fool you into saying that we worship the same God because we all go up to Abraham, right? What are they saying? I worship a Unitarian God, God the Father, and God the Father alone. They don't worship the triune God, which is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that is a very, very important thing for you to understand. They will not affirm Christ as God. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they see Christ as just another human. The Mormons think Jesus was the first one that lived a perfect life so that he could go on to heaven. They see him as created beings. The Jews and the Muslims will deny Christ and the Spirit altogether. John. appreciate that appreciate that nuance so they don't understand they would not prof- can we say can we agree that they would not profess the same god as we do they do not profess the full truth by god I appreciate the clarification on that nuance that's helpful and so they do not profess the same triune god that we do now i think that's important and it's still it's still going to tie into where my ultimate application is so i was went out to I had a neighbor, um, I don't interact with this guy much, but he comes up to me, I was mowing my lawn, and he's like, hey, I know you're a religious guy, and you know, you, 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 uh, um, I, wanna, I wanna get involved, I wanna help. He goes, I'm not gonna become a religious guy, but I wanna help. Well, I'm sorry, this was kind of like an open door in my opinion. So <laughs> I said, let's go out to lunch. I'm like, I'm, I'm mowing the lawn, I'm all hot and sweaty, let's go out to lunch, and so we did. Um, well, in the course of this lunch, and I'm not saying I did this perfectly, but um, uh, but he asked me at one point, he goes, are you saying, because I was like, I, I basically drew it too. I said, well, why is it that you want to help? I think you need to know that. I don't think that I've genuinely thought that. Like, what is your motivation? Like, you know, and I told him, I was, well, here's my motivation. I love people because of my faith in God. And so I kind of shared a real quick gospel presentation there, just plugged it in. And, and, he's, and so then it got us talking about religion. And at one point he asked me, so I, he goes, I know everyone, like Buddhist and, you know, Muslims, and they're all good people, right? Okay, great. So he asked me, he goes, are you saying they're wrong? What do I say? Well, I want my neighbor to like me, right? Well, here's an opportunity, though, to be bold for the truth. And so, again, I'm not saying I did this perfectly, but the way I navigated through that, just to kind of give you guys an idea as to how you can work through this in these just regular day-to-day conversations you have with folks, what did I do? I said, well, I think anyone that truly understands what they believe in those faiths would say I'm wrong. And then I drew it into the triune God. 
And I said, they would never claim that Christ was God, but yet it is fundamentally paramount and important to my own faith that you must believe that Christ was God because it is only in his divine nature that he could then pay the penalty for my sin. You see how I was able to work the gospel into this conversation? The man heard the gospel, and that's all I wanted him to hear at that stage. That's all I felt like he could take at that point. But I was able to say, they themselves would tell me I'm wrong. So you're asking me to say, no, we're all going to get to heaven in our own way. That's what he was saying. And I said, I can't affirm that because what each of us believe is so fundamentally different and it's logically inconsistent that there is no logical way one could say we're all getting to heaven on our own way. So all I tried to do is to just tear down this idea, this belief that is prevalent in our culture in this guy's mind that you can get to heaven, we're all just getting there our own way. No, there is one way to Christ. Make bold claims for Jesus. Make bold claims for Jesus. That's my, that's my encouragement to you. Make bold claims for Jesus. And so that's what I see Paul doing consistently through this. Um, take me out to lunch, help me understand how I could have witnessed to my neighbor better in that moment. But uh, verse 11, just to close us out, the following night the Lord stood by him and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And so again, I think we've seen this multiple times. Phil introduced it many weeks ago, um, where what is God doing for Paul? He's encouraging him. And so be encouraged in boldness. And so we may not necessarily get the same kind of direct conversation with God. I would, I would see that as very, very much not the norm for us as believers today to get the same kind of um, words from God. Um, he's almighty. He can do what he wants. I'm just saying I don't see him doing that on a regular basis anymore. And so, but what, is, but what can I do? Through God's word here, which has been given to me, I can see that God goes with me in this boldness that I can have in adversity that God is still with me. And what is it all about? It's about Paul giving testimony to Christ. It's about Paul giving testimony to Christ. And so that's where you want to draw the courage. What is the courage that I'm drawing? Why am I going to be bold for faith? It's not so that I can have a bunch of notches on my belt. It's not so that I can have a bunch of stories to tell. Oh, I'm a great Christian. No, it's because I'm an ambassador of Christ. And, and that is the testimony that I want to bear I want people to see Christ. I want them to know him, the power of his resurrection. And I want that to be the case. And so what is he going to give the opportunity to do? Testify to the facts about me in Jerusalem. Or, or sorry, he's, so as he had testified to the facts about him here in Jerusalem, he would also then get the opportunity to do that in Rome. And we know from the narrative in Acts that that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to go to Rome. And here is God now encouraging him, saying, keep on keeping on. Keep the boldness. Keep testifying about me because you're going to have that opportunity to do that again. And that is what is going to give Paul that encouragement. And I leave you with this. Acts chapter 28. I'm going to go to the back of the book. Starting in verse 23. And when they had appointed a day for him, he's now in Rome, he's been there for a while, and when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And so Paul had the opportunity to testify about Christ in Rome to many people, of which many believed, but yet he still was bold toward these disbelieving Jews that denied and refused to hear 
and ultimately made very bold statements to them. And so even in the back of the book, Paul wins. He wins because his focus is on boldness for Christ. And that's my encouragement again to you this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, again, the challenge. And God, I ask simply that the Spirit of God would put in us boldness. For we are weak in our flesh. We oftentimes are cowardly. And so we ask that you give us great clarity and boldness. Help us to never lose sight of the eternal kingdom that we represent, and that is Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.